All right, guys, welcome back. We're going to go into our next module here, which is our SD-WAN overlay routing module. And we're going to talk about really what the function is of overlay routing. Uh, we're going to talk about the different types of OMP route advertisements that we're going to see within this uh, section here. How are those OMP routes redistributed into our VPN, into our SD-WAN uh, fabric? And then we're going to talk about how VPN routes are segmented as well. All right. And then the last thing we'll talk about is how we configure and verify uh, our overlay routing. So there's three different lessons that we have in this particular module. Uh, overlay routing, kind of our introduction, if you will, our overview. Then we're going to take a look at OMP route advertisements. And then we're going to take a look at OMP route redistribution and uh, network segmentation in this section as well. So in the first section here, we're going to focus our attention on really just defining what is overlay routing, uh, how we uh, uh, apply overlay routing in our SD-WAN architecture, and we're going to describe the functions of the overlay management protocol, which allows us to provide that routing in the environment. So in our first uh, module, like I said, we're just going to do kind of an overview, if you will, of our overlay routing. Uh, in our second lesson, uh, we're going to take a look at OMP uh, route advertisements and how OMP route advertisements work. Uh, what is an OMP route type? What are the different uh, OMP routes? Uh, what are our, our T-locks? What, what are T-lock routes? What are the colors? And what are the service routes? which is really kind of a, an important topic, right? Because we've been mentioning these terms throughout the entire course, you know, T-locks and colors and everything. Uh, so this is the section that's really going to uh, provide us that detail. And then the last uh, uh, couple of lessons in this section here, we actually have four. I, I mentioned three previously, but we have four. Uh, we're going to take a look at route redistribution and then also configuration and verification of the overlay routing. So in the first section here, We'll focus on just really defining what overlay routing is, how overlay routing is used in our SD-WAN, and what are the functions of the uh, OMP in the, the topology here. All right, so what is overlay uh, routing, right? Overlay routing is a way for us to create kind of a layer three virtual network through our SD-WAN fabric. Uh, we're trying to interconnect all these different locations, our branch locations, our headquarters locations, our data center locations, and so on. And we have to have a way of essentially acting like a service provider, if you will, by providing ways of exchanging network layer reachability information over the SD-WAN independent of whatever the transport is going to be in that particular case, right? The transport itself is a series of uh, different types of circuits or different types of connections, but we want our, our routing um, process, we want the, the, the ability to be able to route over these transport links uh, to be kind of independent. So we don't rely on some sort of underlying transport specifically. We don't rely on some sort of uh, common connectivity at these different locations. And we can have all of these different types of locations or different types of connections available to us for that, uh, for that, communi uh, for that uh, communication, right? So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot that we can talk about when it comes to discussing this, this overlay routing concept. Um, and there's, there's actually you know, quite a bit of information. So what I'm gonna do uh, as part of this discussion is maybe kind of backfill some of the, the key concepts that we've talked about up to this point. And then I'm gonna take a look at and kind of go into more in depth into some of the other things that we've, 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 we've talked about, like a service VPN and a management VPN and so on. All right, now the, we, we know what the different components are, right? We, we looked at V-Edge devices, we looked at V-Smart devices, uh, and we focused uh, a, a lot of attention on, on, you know, kind of the overall architecture uh, of the, uh, the SD-WAN solution, but we haven't really gotten in, into too much depth into the, the OMP piece of this, this overlay management protocol. Uh, OMP is really the heart 
of, of the overlay routing solution. It runs inside of the DTLS control plane connections, and it actually allows us to form peering relationships between our WAN edges and our vSmart controllers. So this is a, a protocol that's gonna run between our, um, our vSmart controllers uh, and our, our, our uh, V-Edge devices or our WAN-Edge devices. And we can have multiple uh, DTLS tunnels, if you will, between these V-Edge devices and the vSmart controllers. We have OMP peering, uh, which is, is uh, going to be, uh, let's say I had multiple vSmart controllers for redundancy and I had multiple V-Edge devices. The, the transport is on the WAN side and the service side is on the LAN side but the DTLS tunnels and those OMP peering relationships are, are gonna be happening on the transport side. The, the peerings are never made between the WAN edge devices. So a uh, V-Edge device is not gonna to talk to another V-Edge device uh, with OMP. Uh, this is the, the, that concept of the separation of the control plane and the data plane in our SD-WAN architecture. Now OMP is actually a proprietary protocol it's actually going to be enabled by default in the transport VPN, which is the SD-WAN fabric VPN. If you recall, that's VPN zero. So we don't have to configure anything to make these relationships happen. Uh, it's not like traditional routing where you have to enable the protocol on an interface or you have to set up neighbor relationships or peering relationships like we do in BGP. It just happens automatically over VPN zero. As soon as our DTLS uh, uh, connections come up uh, from our V-Edge devices to our vSmart controllers, we establish those OMP peerings uh, and they get automatically, uh, automatically created. Now, it says here on the slide that the, the, it's highlighted in the box actually that it's a centralized policy and distributed routing decision process, right? OMP provides the orchestration of routing and secure connectivity between the sites, service chaining, uh, different VPN to, uh, topologies, distribution of routes, distribution of data plane security parameters, and distribution of routing policies. So we, we kind of talk about OMP as more of a traditional routing protocol, but it's much, much more than a routing protocol. It allows us to exchange information that's important for the topology to be built, for the SD-WAN fabric to be built, and so on. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty important component. It's probably one of the most important elements with regard to establishing the overall SD-WAN fabric. All right, so as soon as those DTL connections, uh, DTLS connections come up to the vSmart devices, those OMP peerings are gonna take place automatically. The, the peerings are actually formed between the system IP addresses of the two different devices. And, and like, a, like the slide kind of depicts here, the protocol is responsible for advertising service side prefixes. Now the service side, when, whenever we reference service side, what we're talking about in this case is we're talking about the LAN side, not the SD-WAN fabric side. So the service side prefixes that get associated to the various VPNs, uh, it's going to be responsible for identifying data plane security parameters, overlay routing uh, policies, transport network location mappings. That's an important aspect as well. Uh, so it does a lot more than, than what your kind of traditional routing protocol does. So one of the things that I wanted to do prior, uh, because we saw some terms in some of the previous slides, especially when we we're looking at the different templates, uh, and we were talking about, talking about the transport and service VPNs and so on. I didn't really get into a whole lot of detail on, on what each kind of VPN is related to, right? So I, I wanted to kind of take a minute to go back and talk about that. Um, for example, what is the difference between a transport VPN versus a service VPN? What is the system IP and so on? So a transport VPN, uh, which in this case is VPN zero. In, in, in most configurations, it's gonna be B VPN zero. The transport VPN is a special use VPN that gets associated with all of the interfaces that connect to the WAN, the SD-WAN fabric. 
only interfaces that are in VPN zero can create those control and data plane tunnels. So uh, we see that uh, in the connections from, say, uh, the, our vEdge devices to our, our vSmart controllers, and we might have different types of circuit paths, uh, some primary paths and some secondary paths and so on. All right, but when you, when you hear the term transport VPN, that's what you need to think of is that, that VPN zero in, in most configurations. Now the service VPNs are any of those VPNs between one and 65,530, but excluding 512, right? We talked about 512 as being our kind of out of band management VPN. So interfaces associated with these VPNs, these are the ones that are land facing. These are the ones that uh, where traditional routing protocols run like OSPF or BGP or EIGRP. So these VPNs are really thought of as our traditional uh, VRFs, if you will, our virtual route forwarding instances. Uh, service VPNs don't actually communicate with each other without kind of uh, defining an explicit policy to allow that communication. So each service VPN is gonna be associated to, uh, in essence, what our, our our traditional VPNs would be, right? We, we have our transport VPN for the SD-WAN fabric to set up our, our control uh, uh, plane configuration. We have our, our uh, v, uh, VPN 512 for, for out-of-band management. And then we have our other VPNs, which, is our, which are our service VPNs. Now the system IP, which is pretty important because that's how OMP establishes the adjacencies, that's a 32-bit number. Uh, it's, it's written in a classic uh, IPv4 dotted decimal notation. Every node in the fabric, every single node in the fabric has one of these system IPs. So uh, all of our devices have these, uh, these uh, every node has these addresses, a VBond orchestrator, vManage, vSmart, even our vEdge uh, devices, our WAN Edge devices. They have to have a single unique system IP address defined. The address is what sits inside of that VPN zero. So you can kind of think of a system IP uh, as kind of an equivalent of a router ID that we would configure in kind of a, a classic OSPF scenario, right? The router ID has to be a 32-bit dotted decimal address that is unique to each device within the autonomous system. We also have router IDs associated to BGP and EIGRP, but typically in OSPF, we, we know that that plays a, a pretty significant role in the OSPF implementation. All right, it doesn't have to be routable in your environment. Uh, the, typically, we would want to go ahead and allocate system IPs from a, a range of IPv4 addresses that are allocated to the site where, we, where we're deploying our WAN edges. But we can make the system IP appear to be uh, routable if it's tied to a loopback interface, but it doesn't necessarily have to be routable in this particular case. All right. So uh, OMP uh, is responsible for advertising routes uh, as well as other things, right? Uh, distribution of routes, distribution of data plane security parameters and so on. But it's also responsible for distributing other information. OMP uh, routes themselves, which are called V-routes, our transport location, which are those T-lock tuples that we talked about previously, and then finally our service routes. And we'll talk more about the service routes here in a little bit. All right, so the, the overlay network is basically controlled by this overlay management protocol. Uh, it is, like I said, kind of the most important part of our SD-WAN overlay routing. It allows us to build our uh, VPNs. Uh, it uses this centralized controller process with uh, orchestration. We talked about all those elements, right? The, the vSmart controller and the vBond orchestrator and so on. Uh, we, we derive policy control, uh, access control, and uh, uh, data plane management as well through this OMP process. All right. So the, the bullet points that we identify, like I said, are orchestration of the overlay network communication, including connectivity among our different network sites, service chaining, which is basically the process of mapping uh, our T-locks and service VPNs, 
uh, and our colors and whatnot, our VPN topologies, distribution of service level routing information, uh, which is related to location mappings, distribution of data plane security parameters, and then finally central control and distribution of routing itself. All right. Okay, so overlay routing or OMP actually I should say interacts with all of our traditional routing at our local sites uh, and also interacts with the overlay network. So we're going to be doing things like traditional routing on the LAN side, the service side, maybe OSPF or BGP, and then that, uh, that routing information is, is going to provide that reachability for the local LAN networks. We're going to take that information and we're going to import that routing information into OMP. So OMP is, uh, does actually have uh, essentially three types of things that it's going to transport. I kind of mentioned that briefly, but let me, let me kind of talk about it in, in more detail. Right? We have the V routes, uh, which is uh, uh, the OMP routes themselves. These, these are the prefixes that live in uh, the service side VPN. So these are those prefixes that I'm referring to, the ones that get injected into OM, uh, OMP. Uh, they can come into OMP as either connected routes, static routes, or they could be redistributed in from BGP or OSPF that's running on that service side. And that's what they're talking about in this particular case, right? Those OSPF routes in maybe S1, the BGP routes in S3, the static routes in D2, uh, and the, the static or connected routes in D1, those are going to be somehow inserted or injected into OMP uh, through kind of a, a regular redistribution process. Those OMP routes are what are actually required to resolve the T-locks for the functional forwarding in the overlay network, that, that overlay routing piece. So in comparison with BGP, uh, an OMP route is kind of equivalent to a prefix that would be uh, carried inside of the BGP AFI uh, address family uh, or SAFI fields. Uh, we don't need to get into the specifics of that, but that's, that's essentially what, what's included there. All right. Now, the second thing that OMP is responsible for are the T-locks, the transport locations. Uh, these are the identifiers that live in the transport side of the VPN. So we've got the service side of the VPN, which is the LAN side, and then we've got the transport side of the VPN, which is the SD-WAN fabric, and that's what ties an OMPF, uh, uh, OMP V-route to a physical location. So the T-locks are basically defined in three components. What is the system IP? which every device in, in the SD-WAN topology has that, and that's going to be unique. What is the color and what is the encapsulation type? And we'll get into T-LOC information in a little bit more detail uh, in the next lesson. All right. The T-LOC is actually the only entity in this entire OMP domain that is visible to the underlay network. So uh, if we were to say compare this to BGP, because it's probably something that you're used to seeing, the T-LOC acts as kind of like the next hop for each of the OMP routes that we have in our topology. All right. The third thing is the service routes. The service routes are the identifiers that tie the OMP route to a service in the network, basically specifying the location of the service in the network. Services could include things like um, a firewall service, an IDS service, intrusion detection system, load balancing services, and so on. Uh, those service route, that, that, that service route information is actually carried in both uh, the service and OMP routes themselves. All right, so hopefully that, uh, that gives you an idea of, of in general, how OMP functions. Now, as far as verification goes, it's relatively simple. Uh, if you want to say, for example, verify what kind of peers you have, uh, you can use the command show OMP peers. You can also use vManage to see that as well. Um, and you can, uh, from, that, uh, from that output, you can see whether you have routes that are received from a particular peer, uh, 
uh, routes that are installed in a peer, routes that are sent to a peer, and so on. All right. Hey, Scott. Yes. Can you just go over the service route really quick one more time? Sure, no problem. So the overlay management protocol uh, is a TCP-based uh, extensible control plane protocol. Extensible means that basically it's just a highly customizable protocol. It runs inside of the, the TLS or DTLS connections directly between the vEdge routers and the vSmart controllers and between the vSmart controllers themselves. We talked about that previously. We've mentioned that a few different times. All right. Now, we use address families to advertise reachability information for those T-locks. Uh, we use unicast and multicast destinations that get defined uh, uh, for different services, BFD statistics, uh, traffic engineering, and so on. Uh, but there's a, there's a lot going on with this protocol, right? This is a, a Cisco protocol. Uh, it was introduced... Um, to, to provide kind of the, 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 the cornerstone or the, the keystone if for the, the SD-WAN fabric itself. Um, and uh, it, again, it's enabled by default, so you, it's not something that you ne necessarily have to configure. Uh, the, the V routes, like I said, uh, those are the routes from the site local networks. We talked about that in the previous slide, right? The connected routes, the static routes, the OSPF routes, the BGP routes. Those get advertised uh, from the vEdge devices to the vSmart controller. And then that's going to include several different attributes, right? Um, they, don't, they don't go into this in a whole lot of detail here, but I think it's important to understand because, again, this is the heart of, of, of how we define reachability within the uh, topology itself, right? So the T-lock, and we'll get into those a little bit more, but like I said, very similar to like a BGP next top attribute, it's a three tuple value that contains the system IP address of the OMP speaker, the one that's basically originating the OMP route, the color to identify the link type. Is it MPLS? Is it internet? Is it a cell cellular uh, connection? And the encapsulation tri uh, a type on the, on the tunnel, uh, which is in most cases just going to be IPsec, but there, there could be some other encapsulation types that we specify. Uh, also, the origin is in, is in uh, the origin is included, right? This identifies the origin of the route, uh, you know how it was originated from from BGP or OSPF or connected or static, and then we have kind of the the metric of the original route that's identified, the originator, who is the the IP address from where the route was propagated, where it came from, uh, the preference. Uh, so, if we have, for example, two OMP routes that exist. Uh, preference is used to, to identify which one is more preferred. Uh, the default value in this case is zero, but the higher the preference is the one that's going to be more preferred. The uh, uh, service uh, field, which identifies the service that's associated with that particular OMP route. The site ID, which is literally the site ID where the OMP route was propagated. A tag, if you decide to do tagging, that's an optional thing that you can do. Uh, and then you can take actions based on a tag. It's very similar to like a, a standard route tag. The VPN ID as well. Uh, so the TLOCs themselves identify the transport location. That's what TLOC stands for. These are where the WAN interfaces connect to a uh, the provider, the service provider, the carrier entry point, right? The, the, the SD-WAN transport pieces. So there's a three tuple value. Uh, that has the system ID, which we already talked about, kind of like a router ID, the color, and the encapsulation type. Uh, there's actually only two different encapsulation types that you're going to see. 99% of the time, it's going to be IPsec. But if you want to run peer-to-peer -peer encapsulation without encryption and authentication, you can do that. You would just have to use GRE instead, right? And GRE doesn't provide it, uh, doesn't have a lot of that overhead uh, that... Um, traditional IPsec has. There's some other uh, attributes that are carried. I can't think of all of them, but I mean, the encapsulation type we talked about, site ID, uh, there's going to be the private and public IP addresses, the TLOC private and public IP addresses. Uh, 
The, the private IP address is the interface that's associated with the T-lock. You can think of that as kind of like a, a tunnel interface, if you will. And then the T-lock public IP is going to be the NAT translated address of that particular uh, location. Uh, the carrier type, uh, is this a private carrier or a public carrier? Typically, that's how we would identify that. The color of the link, uh, the preference, like I said. Uh, we might even include a weight, right? Weight uh, is also an attribute that can be carried inside of a T-lock, and that's used to, to identify uh, if we have multiple entry points, uh, you know, we have two, two or more T-locks that we can or reach a particular OMP route. So let's say, uh, for example, T-lock A has a weight of 10 and T-lock B has a weight of 1, uh, uh, and both T-locks have the same preference value. Preference is always going to take precedence over the over the weight then then um, 10 flows get sent out of t-lock a for every one flow that gets sent out of t-lock b all right so it's a way for us to kind of do unequal cost load balancing if you will uh, based on these different uh, transport locations which are tied to physical circuits right you have to keep that in mind these t-lock en entries are tied to a physical cir uh, uh, circuit um, and like I said, service routes as well, these represent basically services that are connected to the VEDGE router or to the local site network where that VEDGE router exists. And then we advertise those services to our vSmart controllers. Uh, and we use um, address family NLRI information to do that, right? Uh, so we have connected routes, we have static routes, we have OSPF inter-area routes, OSPF intra-area routes, and uh, for BGP and external routes, uh, those don't get automatically distributed. We have to redistribute those manually into OMP. But as far as connected, static, and, and the OIA and the O routes between in OSPF, we're going to have, um, we're going to see uh, uh, those being injected into OMP automatically. Now, um, OMP routes aren't by default propagated into the site local IGP. Uh, they need to be actually redistributed uh, explicitly. They're not, they're not automatically redistributed into the site local I IGP. Uh, but the AD, uh, administrative distance, is something that we define with, within routing to identify the trustworthiness of the routing source. OMP routes have an AD value of 250. Uh, which is obviously higher than most of our internal processes. But that makes sense because we would probably would want to uh, not trust, we'd probably want to trust our IGP protocols over an OMP process if we can see those routes at our site local side. So OMP is, is really just the control protocol that's used to exchange routing policy and management information between our vSmart controllers and our vEdge routers in this overlay network. Uh, like I said, it's turned on by default, so as soon as you start up the vSmart controllers and the vEdge routers, we don't have to explicitly configure or enable OMP. They just automatically instantiate or initiate those peering sessions between themselves, and then the OMP sessions and the system IP addresses of the two devices are, are exchanged, and that's how we set up our peering in this particular case. All right. There's certainly some properties that you have to configure and things that you need to consider from uh, that perspective, like what is the system IP of the endpoints and so on. But beyond that, it's a pretty straightforward, pretty straightforward process. So in this lesson, we talked about overlay routing and how we use that to establish our virtual IP fabric across the WAN uh, for our on-demand VPNs, provide route redistribution across our sites within those VPNs. We use this over, uh, overlay management protocol to exchange much more than just routing, policy information, management information between the vEdge devices and the vSmart controllers uh, in our overlay network. We talked about it being a TCP-based extensible control plane protocol using address families uh, to, to provide uh, reachability for the transport locations. We have unicast and multicast destinations that can be either statically or dynamically learned. On the service side routes, um, which again is the land side, uh, 
the service routes uh, and, and whatever additional services we might have, which are layer four through layer seven services. All right, so we'll wrap up this lesson. We'll see you guys in the next lesson.